The Guardian. You're listening to The Guardian Short Story Podcast, featuring great authors reading and discussing their favourite short story. In this edition, we feature Philip Pullman, who has chosen to read The Beauties by Anton Chekhov. I remember driving with my grandfather from the village of Bolshaya Krepkaya in the Don region to Rostov-on-Don when I was a high school boy in the fifth or sixth form. It was a sultry August day, exhausting and depressing. Our eyes were practically gummed up and our mouths were parched from the heat and the hot, dry wind that drove clouds of dust towards us. We did not feel like looking, speaking or thinking. When our dozing driver, a Ukrainian called Karpo, caught me on the cap with his whip while lashing at his horse. I neither protested nor uttered a sound, but just opened my eyes, half asleep as I was, and looked dispiritedly and mildly into the distance to see if a village was visible through the dust. We stopped to feed the horse in the large Armenian settlement of Bakchi Salak, at the house of a rich Armenian whom my grandfather knew. Never in my life have I seen anything more grotesque, Imagine a small, cropped head with thick, beetling eyebrows, a beaked nose, long white whiskers, and a wide mouth with a long cherry wood chibouk sticking out of it. The small head has been clumsily tacked to a gaunt, hunched carcass arrayed in bizarre garb, a short red jacket and gaudy, sky-blue, baggy trousers. The creature walks about, splaying its legs, shuffling its slippers, speaking with its pipe in its mouth, yet comporting itself with the dignity of your true Armenian, unsmiling, goggle-eyed, and trying to take as little notice of his visitors as possible. The Armenian's dwelling was wind-free and dust-free inside, but it was just as disagreeable, stuffy and depressing as the prairie and the road. I remember sitting on a green chest in a corner, dusty and exhausted by the heat. The unpainted wooden walls, the furniture and the ochre-stained floorboards reeked of dry, sun-baked wood. Wherever I looked, there were flies, flies, flies. In low voices, Grandfather and the Armenian discussed sheep, pasturage and grazing problems. I knew there would be a good hour getting the samovar going, and the Grandfather would spend at least another hour over his tea, after which he would sleep for two or three hours more. A quarter of my day would be spent waiting, and then there would be more heat, more dust, more jolting roads. Listening to the two mumbling voices, I felt as if I had long, long ago seen the Armenian, the cupboard full of crockery, the flies and the windows on which the hot sun beat, and that I should cease to see them only in the far distant future. I conceived a loathing for the steppe, the sun and the flies. A Ukrainian woman wearing a shawl brought in a tray of tea things and then the samovar. The Armenian went slowly out into the lobby. Masya, Masya, he shouted. Come and pour the tea. Where are you, Masya? Hurried footsteps were heard, and in came a girl of about sixteen wearing a simple cotton dress and a white shawl. Rinsing the crockery and pouring the tea, she stood with her back to me, and all I noticed was that she was slim-waisted and barefoot, and that her small heels were covered by long trousers. The master of the house offered me tea. As I sat down at table, I glanced at the face of the girl who was handing me my glass, and suddenly felt as if a fresh breeze had blown over my spirits and dispelled all the day's impressions all the dreariness and dust. I saw the enchanting features of the loveliest face I have ever encountered, either dreaming or waking. Here was a truly beautiful girl, and I took this in at first glance like a lightning flash. Though I am ready to swear that Masha, or Masya, as her father called her in his Armenian accent, was a real beauty, I cannot prove it. Clouds sometimes jostle each other at random on the horizon, and the hidden sun paints them and the sky every possible hue, crimson, orange, gold, lilac, muddy pink. One cloud resembles a monk, another a fish, a third a turbaned Turk. Embracing a third of the sky, the setting sun glitters on a church cross and on the windows of the manor house. It is reflected in the river and in the ponds, it quivers on the trees. Far, far away against the sunset a flock of wild ducks flies off to its night's rest. The boy herding his cows, the surveyor driving along the mill dam in his chaise, the ladies and gentlemen who are out for a stroll, all gaze at the sunset, all find it awesomely beautiful. But wherein does that beauty lie? No one knows, no one can say. I was not alone in finding the Armenian girl beautiful. My old grandfather, a man of eighty, 
tough, indifferent to women and the beauties of nature, gazed at her tenderly for a full minute. "'Is that your daughter, Azit Nazarovich?' he asked. "'Yes, she is,' the Armenian answered. "'A fine-looking young lady.' An artist would have called the Armenian girl's beauty classic and severe. To contemplate such loveliness is to be imbued, heaven knows why, with the conviction that the regular features, that the hair, eyes, nose, mouth, neck and figure, together with all the motions of the young body, have been unerringly combined by nature in a harmonious whole without a single discordant note. You somehow fancy that the ideally beautiful woman must have a nose just like hers, straight but slightly aquiline, the same big dark eyes, the same long lashes, the same languorous glance. The curly black hair and eyebrows seem ideally suited to the delicate white skin of the forehead and cheeks, just as green reeds and quiet streams go together. Her white neck and youthful bosom are not fully developed, but only a genius could sculpt them, you feel. As you gaze, you gradually conceive a wish to say something exceedingly pleasant, sincere and beautiful to the girl, something as beautiful as herself. At first I was offended and disconcerted by Masha taking no notice of me, but casting her eyes down all the time. It was as if some special aura, proud and happy, segregated her from me and jealously screened her from my gaze. It must be because I'm covered with dust, because I'm sunburnt, because I'm only a boy, I thought. But then I gradually forgot myself and surrendered entirely to the sensation of beauty. I no longer remembered the dreary step and the dust, no longer heard the flies buzzing, no longer tasted my tea. All I was conscious of was the beautiful girl standing on the other side of the table. My appreciation of her beauty was rather remarkable. It was not desire, not ecstasy, not pleasure that she aroused in me, but an oppressive, yet agreeable, melancholia, a sadness vague and hazy as a dream. I somehow felt sorry for myself, for my grandfather, for the Armenian, and even for the girl. I felt as if we had all four lost, irrecoverably, something vitally important. Grandfather, too, grew sad. He no longer spoke of sheep and grazing, but was silent and glanced pensively at the girl. After tea, Grandfather took his nap, and I went out and sat on the porch. This house, like all the others at Bakchi Salak, caught the full heat of the sun. There were no trees, no awnings, no shadows. Overgrown with goosefoot and wild mallow, the Armenian's big yard was lively and cheerful despite the intense heat. Threshing was in progress behind one of the low hurdles intersecting the large expanse at various points. Twelve horses, harnessed abreast and forming a single long radius, trotted round a pole fixed in the exact centre of the threshing area. Beside them walked a Ukrainian in a long waistcoat and broad baggy trousers, cracking his whip and shouting as if to tease the animals and flaunt his power over them. Come on there, damn you! Ah, come on, rot you! Afraid, are you? The horses, bay, grey and skewbald, had no idea why they were being forced to rotate in one spot and tread down wheat straw. They moved reluctantly, as though with difficulty, lashing their tails offendedly. The wind raised great clouds of golden chaff from under their hoofs and bore it far away across the hurdles. Women with rakes swarmed near the tall new ricks, and carts went to and fro. In a second yard beyond those ricks, another dozen such horses trotted round their pole, while a similar Ukrainian cracked his whip and mocked them. The steps on which I was setting were hot. Owing to the heat, glue was oozing here and there from the wood of the slender banisters and window frames. In the streaks of shade beneath the steps and shutters, tiny red beetles huddled together. The sun baked my head, chest and back, but I paid no attention to it being conscious only of the rap of bare feet on the wooden floor of the lobby and the other rooms behind me. Having cleared away the tea, Masha ran down the steps, disturbing the air as she passed, and flew like a bird to a small grimy outhouse, it must be the kitchen, whence proceeded the smell of roast mutton and the sound of angry Armenian voices. She disappeared through the dark doorway, where her place was taken by a bent, red-faced old Armenian woman wearing baggy green trousers and angrily scolding someone. Then Masha suddenly reappeared in the doorway, flushed from the kitchen's heat, and carrying a big black loaf on her shoulder. Swaying gracefully under the bread's weight, she ran across the yard to the threshing floor, leapt a hurdle, plunged into a golden cloud of chaff, and vanished behind the carts. The Ukrainian in charge of the horses lowered his whip, stopped talking to them, and gazed silently towards the carts for a minute. 
Then, when the girl once more darted past the horses and jumped the hurdle, he followed her with his eyes, shouting at his horses in a highly aggrieved voice, Rot your hellhounds! After that, I continually heard her bare feet and saw her rushing round the place with a grave, preoccupied air. Now she ran down the steps, passing me in a gust of air, now to the kitchen, now to the threshing floor, now through the gate, and I could hardly turn my head fast enough to watch. The more often I caught sight of this lovely creature, the more melancholy I became. I felt sorry for myself, for her, and for the Ukrainian mournfully watching her as she ran through the chaff to the carts. Did I envy her beauty? Did I regret that the girl was not mine and never would be, that I was a stranger to her? Did I have an inkling that her rare beauty was accidental, superfluous, and, like everything else on earth, transitory? Was my grief that peculiar sensation which the contemplation of true beauty arouses in any human being? God only knows. The three hours of waiting passed unnoticed. I felt that I had not had enough time to feast my eyes on Masha when Carpo rode off to the river, bathed the horse and began to hitch it up. The wet animal snorted with pleasure and kicked his hoof against the shafts. Get back! Carpo shouted. Grandfather woke up. Masha opened the creaking gates and we got into the carriage and drove out of the yard, in silence, as if angry with one another. When Rostov and Naki Chivan appeared in the distance a couple of hours later, Carpo, who had said nothing all that time, looked round quickly. "'Splendid girl, the old Armenian's daughter,' said he, and whipped the horse. On another occasion, after I had become a student, I was travelling south by rail. It was May. At a station between Belgorod and Kharkov, I think, I got out of the carriage to stroll on the platform. Evening shadows had already fallen on the station garden, on the platform and on the fields. The station building hid the sunset, but you could tell that the sun had not yet vanished completely by the topmost delicately pink puffs of smoke from the engine. While pacing the platform, I noticed that, of the other passengers who were taking an airing, the majority were strolling or standing near one of the second-class carriages, their attitude conveying the impression that someone of consequence must be sitting in it. Among these inquisitive persons I saw the artillery officer who was my travelling companion, an intelligent, cordial, likeable fellow, as is everybody with whom one strikes up a brief acquaintance on one's journeys. I asked him what he was looking at. He said nothing in reply, but just indicated a feminine figure with his eyes. It was a young girl of 17 or 18 in Russian national costume, bareheaded, with a lace shawl thrown carelessly over one shoulder. She was not a passenger, and I suppose she was the station master's daughter or sister. She stood near a carriage window talking to an elderly female passenger. Before I knew what was happening, I was suddenly overwhelmed by the same sensation that I had once experienced in the Armenian village. That the girl was strikingly beautiful, neither I nor the others gazing at her could doubt. Were one to describe her appearance item by item, as is common practice, then the only truly lovely feature was her thick, fair, undulating hair, loose on her shoulders and held back on her head by a dark ribbon. All her other features were either irregular or very ordinary. Her eyes were screwed up, either as a flirtatious mannerism or through short-sightedness. Her nose was faintly retroussé. Her mouth was small. Her profile was feeble and insipid. Her shoulders were narrow for her age. And yet the girl produced the impression of true loveliness. Gazing at her, I realised that a Russian face does not require strict regularity of feature to seem handsome. Indeed, had this young woman's uptilted nose been replaced by another, regular and impeccably formed, like the Armenian girls, I fancy her face would have lost all its charm. Standing at the window, talking and shivering in the cool of the evening, the girl kept looking round at us. Now she placed her hands on her hips, now raised them to her head to pat her hair. She spoke, she laughed, she expressed surprise at one moment and horror at the next, and I don't recall a moment when her face and body were at rest. It was in these tiny, infinitely exquisite movements in her smile, in the play of her expression, in her rapid glances at us that the whole mystery and magic of her beauty consisted, and also in the way this subtle grace of movement was combined with the fresh spontaneity and innocence that throbbed in her laughter and speech, together with the helplessness that so appeals to us in children, birds, fawns, young trees. This was the beauty of a butterfly. It goes with waltzing, fluttering about the garden, laughing and merrymaking does not go with serious thought, grief and repose. 
Had a gust of wind blown down the platform, had it started raining, then the fragile body would suddenly, it seemed, have faded, and the wayward loveliness would have been dispersed like pollen from a flower. Ah, oh, well, muttered the officer, sighing, as we went to our carriage after the second bell. But what his interjection meant, I do not pretend to judge. Perhaps he felt sad, and did not want to leave the girl and the spring evening for the stuffy train. Or perhaps, like me, he was irrationally sorry for the lovely girl, for himself, for me, and for all the passengers as they drifted limply and reluctantly back to their compartments. We walked past a station window, behind which a wan, way-faced telegraphist, with upstanding red curls and high cheekbones, sat at his apparatus. "'I'll bet the telegraph operator is in love with the pretty little miss,' sighed the officer. "'To live out in the wilds under the same roof as that ethereal creature and not fall in love, it's beyond the power of man. "'And what a misfortune, my dear chap, what a mockery to be round-shouldered, unkempt, dreary, respectable and intelligent, "'and to be in love with that pretty, silly little girl who never pays you a scrap of attention.' Or even worse, suppose the lovesick telegraphist is married, suppose his wife is as round-shouldered, unkempt and respectable as himself. What agony! A guard stood on the small open platform between our carriage and the next. Resting his elbows on the railing, he was gazing towards the girl, and his flabby, disagreeably beefy face, exhausted by sleepless nights and the train's jostling, expressed ecstasy combined with the most profound sorrow as if he could see his own youth, his own happiness, his sobriety, his purity, his wife, his children, reflected in the girl. He seemed to be repenting his sins, and to be conscious with every fibre of his being that the girl was not his, and that for him, prematurely aged, clumsy, fat-visaged, the happiness of an ordinary human being and trained passenger was as far away as heaven. The third bell rang, whistles sounded, the train trundled off. Past our window flashed another guard, the station master, the garden, and then the lovely girl with her marvellous, childishly sly smile. Putting my head out and looking back, I saw her watching the train as she walked along the platform past the window with the telegraph clerk, then patted her hair and ran into the garden. No longer did the station buildings hide the sunset. We were in open country, but the sun had already set, and black puffs of smoke were settling over the green, velvety young corn. The spring air, the dark sky, the railway carriage, all seemed sad. Our guard, that familiar figure, came in and began lighting the candles. Philip Pullman reading The Beauties by Anton Chekhov Philip spoke to Lisa Allardyce of Guardian Review about his choice. Well, I love Chekhov, and uh, I, I was interested in this story because it reminded me of um, that description by a critic whose name I've forgotten of Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot as a play in which nothing happens twice. This is a short story in which nothing happens twice. The narrator sees a girl, uh, thinks she's beautiful. A couple of years later, sees another girl, thinks she's beautiful, and that's it, nothing happens. But what a wealth of feeling, what a wealth of melancholy, what a wealth of precise and brilliant impressions of uh, of sun-baked step of railway station under the pink light of sunset. It's such a vivid impression of things and of the loveliness of these two very different girls. As you say, it, in many ways it's very Chekhovian in the sense that it is very fluid, it, it's episodic. And and it is all about the, the transitoriness of both beauty and, and happiness, isn't it? The poor boy, the, the, the two instances, and it's not just the, the boy. In each case, there is an on, a sort of second onlooker. There's the Ukrainian yeah. with the horses, and then there's the officer. And they're both looking at the girl, and the boy is looking at the man, looking at the, yeah. the girl. That's right. It's all about observation. It's all about these, these very transitory things. Both of these incidents take place in the course of a journey. So we're going from somewhere to somewhere else. We're not stopping anywhere. We're not, this isn't a destination. It's just somewhere on the way. And each of the two girls is associated in the story with, um, with the sun in one way or another. The first girl appears in the baking heat of midday and the second girl uh, is there on the station platform where the sun is just setting. And when he's left, when the narrator has left the second girl behind, when he's on the train and the sun has set, the poor old guard who's also looking after her with a longing in his face, the beefy, disagreeable-looking guard, 
uh, he comes in and lights the candles. Candle, of course, being a much lesser light, a light suitable to the smallness, perhaps, of what's going, what's ahead of us, rather than the brilliance of the outside sun, which was associated with these two girls, of whom he'll never see again. This sense of, of melancholy and transitoriness, one thing that's come out over and over again is, is that the short story as a genre seems to be one of sadness and and you feel that here from the boredom at the beginning to the candle at the end it, it's steeped in sort of inertia and melancholy is melancholy it? certainly yes well that, but that's that's Chekhov as well I mean there are there are humorous short stories um, there are short stories that uh, have, have all sorts of different um, emotional tones to them but it is a genre which I admire very much without being able to do it myself I've never really succeeded in writing a short story um, I start one I find I've written the first 30 pages of a novel so I can't uh, talk as a practitioner of this great art but it is a great art and Chekhov was a master of it and one of the things a short story does is to convey to you a mood a, an impression of something a, 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 something like a well I once visited a, a, a rose grower in Lincolnshire who made a person who made rose water and rose oil and so on and uh, I wanted to find out how, how he did this for, for something I was writing and he said that the it, it's really very simple. You pick the roses and you put them in a big vat of water and you boil them and you distill them with the steam that comes out and that's your rose water. But every so often, he said, you skim the top of the of the vat and take off the little tiny bit of oil that's got that's, that's concentrated there. And little by little, you skim off this rose oil and you put it in a tiny little bottle and you sell it for 50 quid. And what you've got there in that little 50 quid bottle, one of which I duly bought, was essence, the most concentrated, intense essence of all that roseness, all that roseness in the, in the afternoon air. So uh, the short story is, is like that concentrated little bottle of rose oil. Chekhov has skimmed off the emotion that's lying on the top of these two little incidents and packed it tightly and put a stopper on it and put it in this perfect little short story. Philip Pullman. And you can download all the short stories in this series at guardian.co.uk forward slash books. For more great downloads, go to guardian.co.uk forward slash audio.